section eleven of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by annie hill curiosities of literature volume three by isaac disraeli section eleven secret history of the building of blenheim the secret history of this national edifice derives importance from its nature and the remarkable characters involved in the unparalleled transaction the great architect when obstructed in the progress of his work by the irregular payments of the workmen appears to have practised one of his own comic plots to put the debts on the hero himself footnote sixty two while the duke who had it much at heart to inhabit the palace of his fame but tutored into weariness under the vigilant and fierce eye of atosa and a footnote sixty two would neither approve nor disapprove silently looked on in hope and in grief from year to year as the work proceeded or as it was left at stand footnote sixty three at length we find this comedy la Moyante, wound up by the duchess herself in an attempt to utterly ruin the enraged and insulted architect End footnote 63. perhaps this was the first time that it had ever been resolved in parliament to raise a public monument of glory and gratitude to an individual the novelty of the attempt may serve as the only excuse for the loose arrangements which followed after parliament had approved of the design without voting any specific supply for the purpose the queen always issued the orders at her own expense and commanded expedition and while anne lived footnote sixty four the expenses of the building were included in her majesty's debt as belonging to the civil list sanctioned by parliament End footnote sixty four when george the first came to the throne the parliament declared the debt to be the debt of the queen and the king granted a privy seal as for other debts the crown and the parliament had hitherto proceeded in perfect union respecting this national edifice however i find that the workmen were greatly in arrears for when george the first ascended the throne they gladly accepted a third part of their several debts the great architect found himself amidst inextricable difficulties with the fertile invention which amuses in his comedies he contrived an extraordinary scheme by which he proposed to make the duke himself responsible for the building of blenheim however much the duke longed to see the magnificent edifice concluded he showed the same calm intrepidity in the building of blenheim as he had in its field of action aware that if he himself gave any order or suggested any alteration he might be involved in the expense of the building he was never to be circumvented never to be surprised into a spontaneous emotion of pleasure or disapprobation on no occasion he declares had he even entered into conversation with the architect though his friend or with any one acting under his orders about blenheim house such impenetrable prudence on all sides had often blunted the subdolous ingenuity of the architect and plotter of comedies in the absence of the duke when abroad in seventeen o five sir john contrived to obtain from lord godolphin the friend and relative of the duke of marlborough and probably his agent in some of his concerns a warrant constituting van Brugh surveyor with power of contracting on the behalf of the duke of marlborough how he prevailed on lord godolphin to get this appointment does not appear his lordship probably conceived it was useful and might assist in expediting the great work the favourite object of the hero this warrant however van Brugh kept entirely to himself he never mentioned to the duke that he was in possession of any such power nor on his return did he claim to have it renewed the building proceeded with the same delays and the payments with the same irregularity the veteran now foresaw what happened that he should never be the inhabitant of his own house 
the public money issued from the treasury was never to be depended on and after seventeen twelve the duke took the building upon himself for the purpose of accommodating the workmen they had hitherto received what was called crown pay which was high wages and uncertain payment and they now gladly abated a third of their prices but though the duke had undertaken to pay the workmen this could make no alteration in the claims on the treasury blenheim was to be built for marlborough not by him it was a monument raised by the nation to their hero not a palace to be built by their mutual contributions whether marlborough found that his own million might be slowly injured while the treasury remained still obdurate or that the architect was still more and more involved i cannot tell but in seventeen fifteen the workmen appear to have struck and the old delays and stand still again renewed it was then sir john for the first time produced the warrant he had extracted from lord godolphin to lay before the treasury adding however a memorandum to prevent any misconception that the duke was to be considered as the paymaster the debts incurred devolving on the crown this part of our secret history requires more development than i am enabled to afford as my information is drawn from the case of the duke of marlborough in reply to sir john's depositions it is possible van brew may suffer more than he ought in this narration which however incidentally notices his own statements a new scene opens van brew not obtaining his claims from the treasury and the workmen becoming more clamorous the architect suddenly turns around on the duke at once to charge him with the whole debt the pitiable history of this magnificent monument of public gratitude from its beginnings is given by van brew in his deposition the great architect represents himself as being comptroller of her majesty's works and as such was appointed to prepare a model which model of blenheim house her majesty kept in her palace and gave her commands to issue money according to the direction of mr travers the queen's surveyor general that the lord treasurer appointed her majesty's own officers to supervise these works that it was upon defect of money from the treasury that the workmen grew uneasy that the work was stopped till further orders of money from the treasury that the queen then ordered enough to secure it from winter weather that afterwards she ordered more for payment of the workmen that they were paid in part and upon sir john's telling them that the queen's resolution to grant them a further supply after a stop put to it by the duchess's order they went on and incurred the present debt that this was afterwards brought to the house of commons as the debt of the crown not owing from the queen to the duke of marlborough but to the workmen and this by the queen's officers during the uncertain progress of the building and while the workmen were often in deep arrears it would seem that the architect often designed to involve the marlboroughs in its fate and his own he probably thought that some of their round million might bear to be chipped to finish his great work with which too their glory was so intimately connected the famous duchess had evidently put the duke on the defensive but once perhaps was the duke on the point of indulging some generous architectural fancy when lo atossa stepped forwards and put a stop to the building when van brew at length produced the warrant of lord godolphin empowering him to contract for the duke this instrument was utterly disclaimed by marlborough the duke declares it existed without his knowledge and that if such an instrument for a moment was to be held valid no man would be safe but might be ruined by the act of another van brew seems to have involved the intricacy of his plot till it fell into some contradictions the queen he had not found difficult to manage but after her death when the treasury failed in its golden source he seemed to have sat down to contrive how to make the duke the great debtor van brew swears that he himself looked upon the crown as engaged to the duke of marlborough for the expense but that he believes the workmen always looked upon the duke as their paymaster 
he advances so far as to swear that he made a contract with particular workmen which contract was not unknown to the duke this was not denied but the duke in his reply observes that he knew not that the workmen were employed for his account or by his own agent never having heard till sir john produced the warrant from lord godolphin that sir john was his surveyor which he disclaims our architect however opposite his depositions appear contrived to become a witness to such facts as tended to conclude the duke to be the debtor for the building and in his depositions has taken as much care to have the guilt of perjury without the punishment of it as any man could do he so managed though he has not sworn to contradictions that the natural tendency of one part of his evidence pressed one way and the natural tendency of another part presses the direct contrary way in his formal memorial the main design was to disengage the duke from the debt in his depositions the main design was to charge the duke with the debt van brew it must be confessed exerted not less of his dramatic than his architectural genius in the building of blenheim the case concludes with an eloquent reflection where van brew is distinguished as the man of genius though not in this predicament the man of honour if at last the charge run into by order of the crown must be upon the duke yet the infamy of it must go upon another who was perhaps the only architect in the world capable of building such a house and the only friend in the world capable of contriving to lay the debt upon one to whom he was so highly obliged there is a curious fact in the depositions of van brew by which we might infer that the idea of blenheim house might have originated with the duke himself he swears that in 1704 the duke met him and told him he designed to build a house and must consult him about a model but it was the queen who ordered the present house to be built with all expedition the whole conduct of this national edifice was unworthy of the nation if in truth the nation ever entered heartily into it no specific sum had been voted in parliament for so great an undertaking which afterwards was the occasion of involving all the parties concerned in trouble and litigation threatened the ruin of the architect and i think we shall see by van brew's letter was finished at the sole charge and even under the superintendence of the duchess herself it may be a question whether this magnificent monument of glory did not rather originate in the spirit of party in the urgent desire of the queen to allay the pride and jealousies of the marlboroughs from the circumstance to which van brew has sworn that the duke had designed to have a house built by van brew before blenheim had been resolved on we may suppose that this intention of the duke's afforded the queen a suggestion of a national edifice archdeacon cox in his life of marlborough has obscurely alluded to the circumstances attending the building of blenheim the illness of the duke and the tedious litigation which ensued caused such delays that little progress was made in the work at the time of his decease in the interim a serious misunderstanding arose between the duchess and the architect which forms the subject of a voluminous correspondence van brew was in consequence removed and the direction of the building confided to other hands under her own immediate superintendence this voluminous correspondence would probably afford words that burn of the lofty insolence of atossa and thoughts that breathe of the comic wit it might too relate in many curious points to the stupendous fabric itself if her grace condescended to criticise its parts with the frank roughness she is known to have done to the architect himself his own defence and explanations might serve to let us into the bewildering fancies of his magical architecture of that self-creation for which he was so much abused in his own day as to have lost his real avocation as an architect and stands condemned for posterity in the volatile bitterness of lord orford nothing is left for us but our own convictions to behold and to be for ever astonished but this voluminous correspondence alas 
the historian of war and politics overlooks with contempt the little secret histories of art and of human nature and a voluminous correspondence which indicates so much and on which not a solitary idea is bestowed has only served to petrify our curiosity of this quarrel between the famous duchess and van Brew, i have only recovered several vivacious extracts from confidential letters of van Brew's to jacob tonson there was an equality of the genius of invention as well as rancour in her grace and the wit whether atossa like van Brew, could have had the patience to have composed a comedy of five acts i will not determine but unquestionably she could have dictated many scenes with equal spirit we have seen van Brew attempting to turn the debts incurred by the building of blenheim on the duke we now learn for the first time that the duchess with equal aptitude contrived a counterplot to turn the debts on van Brew. i have the misfortune of losing for i now see little hopes of ever getting it near two thousand pounds due to me for many years service plague and trouble at blenheim which that wicked woman of marlborough is so far from paying me that the duke being sued by some of the workmen for work done there she has tried to turn the debt due to them upon me for which i think she ought to be hanged in seventeen twenty two on occasion of the duke's death van Brew gives an account to tonson of the great wealth of the marlboroughs with a caustic touch at his illustrious victims the duke of marlborough's treasure exceeds the most extravagant guests the grand settlement which it was suspected her grace had broken into pieces stands good and hands an immense wealth to lord godolphin and his successors a round million has been moving about in loans on the land tax and sea this the treasury knew before he died and this was exclusive of his land his five thousand pounds a year upon the post office his mortgages upon a distressed estate his south sea stock his annuities and which were not subscribed in and besides what is in foreign banks and yet this man could neither pay his workmen their bills nor his architect his salary he has given his widow may a scottish ensign get her ten thousand pounds a year to spoil blenheim in her own way twelve thousand pounds a year to keep herself clean and go to law two thousand pounds a year to lord rialton for present maintenance and lord gunolphin only five thousand pounds a year jointure if he outlives my lady this last is a wretched article the rest of the heap for these are but snippings goes to lord godolphin and so on she will have forty thousand pounds a year in present atossa as the quarrel heated and the plot thickened with the maliciousness of puck and the haughtiness of an empress of blenheim invented the most cruel insult that ever architect endured one perfectly characteristic of that extraordinary woman van Brew went to blenheim with his lady in a company from castle howard another magnificent monument of his singular genius we stayed two nights in woodstock but there was an order to the servants under her grace's own hand not to let me enter blenheim unless that should not mortify me enough she having somehow learned that my wife was of the company sent an express the night before we came there with orders that if she came with the castle howard ladies the servants should not suffer her to see either house gardens or even to enter the park so she was forced to sit all day long and keep me company at the inn this was a coup de theatre in this joint comedy of atossa and van Brew, the architect of blenheim lifting his eyes towards his own massive grandeur exiled to a dull inn and imprisoned with one who required rather to be consoled than capable of consoling the enraged architect in seventeen twenty five atossa still pursuing her hunted prey had driven it to a spot which she flattered herself would enclose it with the security of a preserve this produced the following explosion 
i have been forced into chancery by that b b b the duchess of marlborough where she has got an injunction upon me by her friend the late good chancellor earl of macclesfield who declared that i was never employed by the duke and therefore had no demand upon his estate for my services at blenheim since my hands were thus tied up from trying by law to recover my arrear i have prevailed with sir robert walpole to help me in a scheme which i proposed to him by which i got my money in spite of the hussy's teeth my carrying this point enrages her much and the more because it is of considerable weight in my small fortune which she has heartily endeavoured so to destroy as to throw me into an english bastille there to finish my days as i began them in a french one plot for plot and the superior claims of one of practised invention are vindicated the writer long accustomed to comedy writing has excelled the self-taught genius of atossa the scheme by which van brew's fertile invention aided by sir robert walpole finally circumvented the avaricious the haughty and the capricious atossa remains untold unless it is alluded to by the passage in lord orford's antidotes of painting where he informs us that the duchess quarrelled with sir john and went to law with him but though he proved to be in the right or rather because he proved to be in the right she employed sir christopher wren to build a house in st james park i have to add a curious discovery respecting van brew himself which explains a circumstance in his life not hitherto understood in all the biographies of van brew from the time of sibber's lives of the poets the early part of the life of this man of genius remains unknown it is said he descended from an ancient family in cheshire which came originally from france though by the name which properly written would be van Brew, he would appear to be of dutch extraction a tale is universally repeated that sir john once visiting france in the prosecution of his architectural studies while taking a survey of some fortifications excited alarm and was carried to the bastille where to deepen the interest of the story he sketched a variety of comedies which he must have communicated to the governor who whispering it doubtless as an affair of state to several of the noblesse these admirers of sketches of comedies english ones no doubt procured the release of his english moliere this tale is further confirmed by a very odd circumstance sir john built at greenwich on a spot still called van Brew's fields two whimsical houses one on the side of greenwich park is still called the bastille house built on its model to commemorate his imprisonment footnote sixty five not a word of this detailed story is probably true that the bastille was an object which sometimes occupied the imagination of our architect is probable for by the letter we have just quoted we discover from himself the singular incident of van brew's having been born in the bastille and footnote sixty five desirous probably of concealing his alien origin this circumstance cast his early days into obscurity he felt that he was a briton in all respects but that of his singular birth the father of van brew married sir dudley carleton's daughter we are told that he had political connections and one of his political tours had probably occasioned his confinement in that state dungeon where his lady was delivered of her burden of love this odd fancy of building a bastille house at greenwich a fortified prison suggested to his first life writer the fine romance which must now be thrown aside among those literary fictions the french distinguish by the softening and yet impudent term of antidotes hasadis which formerly verilis and his imitators furnished their pages lies which looked like facts footnote sixty two the name by which pope ruthlessly satirizes sarah duchess of marlborough footnote sixty three i draw the materials of this secret history from an unpublished case of the duke of marlborough and sir john van brew 
as also from some confidential correspondence of van brew with jacob tonson his friend and publisher footnote sixty four parliament voted five hundred thousand pounds for the building which was insufficient the queen added thereto the honour of woodstock an appendage of the crown on the simple condition of rendering at windsor castle every year on the anniversary of the victory of blenheim a flag adorned with three fleur-de-lis as a quittance for all manner of rents suits and services due to the crown footnote sixty five cunningham in his lives of the british architects does not incline to the conclusions above drawn he says i suspect that van brew in saying he began his days in the bastille meant only that he was its tenant in early life at the commencement of his manhood the same author tells us that van brew's grandfather fled from ghent his native city to avoid the persecutions of the duke of alva and established himself as a merchant in walbrook where his son lived after him and where john van brew afterwards the great architect was born in the year sixteen sixty six his father at this time comptroller of the treasury chamber cunningham thinks the cheshire part of the genealogy unlikely to be true end of section eleven Section 12 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 3 by Isaac Disraeli. Secret History of Sir Walter Raleigh. Footnote raleigh as was much practised to a much later period wrote his name various ways i have discovered at least how it was pronounced in his time thus raleigh capital r a w l y this may be additionally confirmed by the scottish poet drummond who spells it in his conversations with ben jonson raleigh capital r a u g h l e y the translation of ortelius epitome of the world sixteen o three is dedicated to sir walter raleigh capital r a w l e i g h c volume two part two hundred and sixty one article orthography of proper names it was also written raleigh capital r a w l y by his contemporaries he sometimes wrote it raleigh capital r a l e g h the last syllable probably pronounced l y or l a y raleigh capital r a l e g h appears on his official seal in the footnote raleigh exercised in perfection in compatible talents and his character connects the opposite extremes of our nature his book of life with its incidents of prosperity and adversity of glory and humiliation was as chequered as the novelist would desire for a tale of fiction yet in this mighty genius there lies an unsuspected disposition which requires to be demonstrated before it is possible to conceive its reality from his earliest days probably by his early reading of the romantic incidents of the first spanish adventures in the new world he himself betrayed the genius of an adventurer which prevailed in his character to the latest and it often involved him in the practice of mean artifices and petty deceptions which appear like folly in the wisdom of a sage like ineptitude in the profound views of a politician like cowardice in the magnanimity of a hero and degrade by their littleness the grandeur of a character which was closed by a splendid death worthy the life of the wisest and the greatest of mankind the sunshine of his days was in the reign of elizabeth from a boy always dreaming of romantic 
conquests for he was born in an age of heroism and formed by nature for the chivalric gallantry of the court of a maiden queen from the moment he with such infinite art cast his rich mantle over the miry spot his life was a progress of glory all about raleigh was as splendid as the dress he wore his female sovereign whose eyes loved to dwell on men who might have been fit subjects for the fairy queen of spencer penurious of reward only recompensed her favourites by suffering them to make their own fortunes on sea and land and elizabeth listened to the glowing projects of her hero indulging that spirit which could have conquered the world to have laid the toy at the feet of the sovereign this man this extraordinary being who was prodigal of his life and fortune on the spanish main in the idleness of peace could equally direct his invention to supply the domestic wants of everyday life in his project of an office for address nothing was too high for his ambition nor too humble for his genius pre-eminent as a military and a naval commander as a statesman and a student raleigh was as intent on forming the character of prince henry as that prince was studious of moulding his own aspiring qualities by the genius of the friend whom he contemplated yet the active life of raleigh is not more remarkable than his contemplative one he may well rank among the founders of our literature for composing on a subject exciting little interest his fine genius has sealed his unfinished volume with immortality for magnificence of eloquence and massiveness of thought we must still dwell on his pages footnote i shall give in the article literary unions a curious account how raleigh's history of the world was composed which has hitherto escaped discovery in the footnote such was the man who was the adored patron of spencer whom ben jonson proud of calling other favourites his sons honoured by the title of his father and who left political instructions which milton deigned to edit but how has it happened that of so elevated a character gibbon has pronounced that it was ambiguous while it is described by hume as a great but ill-regulated mind there was a peculiarity in the character of this eminent man he practised the cunning of an adventurer a cunning most humiliating in the narrative the great difficulty to overcome in this discovery is how to account for a sage and a hero acting folly and cowardice and attempting to obtain by circuitous deception what it may be supposed so magnanimous a spirit would only deign to possess himself of by direct and open methods since the present article was written a letter hitherto unpublished appears in the recent edition of shakespeare which curiously and minutely records one of those artifices of the kind which i am about to narrate at length when under elizabeth raleigh was once in confinement it appears that seeing the queen passing by he was suddenly seized with a strange resolution of combating with the governor and his people declaring that the mere sight of the queen had made him desperate as a confined lover would feel at the sight of his mistress the letter gives a minute narrative of sir walter's astonishing conduct and carefully repeats the warm romantic style in which he talked of his royal mistress and his formal resolution to die rather than exist out of her presence footnote it is narrated in a letter to sir robert cecil from mr afterwards sir arthur gorges and runs as follows upon a report of her majesty's being at sir george carey's sir w raleigh having gazed and sighed a long time at his study window from whence he might discern the barges and boats about the black 
friar's stairs suddenly break out into a great distemper and swear that his enemies had on purpose brought her majesty thither to break his gall in sunder with tantalus's torments that when she went away he might see death before his eyes with many such like conceits and as a man transported with passion he sware to sir george carey that he would disguise himself and get into a pair of oars to ease his mind but with a sight of the queen or else he protested his heart would break this of course the jailer refused and so they fell to fighting scrambling and brawling like madmen until parted by gorgies sir walter followed up his absurdity by another letter to cecil couched in the language of romance in which he declares that while the queen was yet near at hand that i might hear of her once in two or three days my sorrows were the less but now my heart is cast into the depth of all misery End of footnote this extravagant scene with all its cunning has been most elaborately penned by the ingenious letter-writer with a hint to the person whom he addresses to suffer it to meet the eye of their royal mistress who could not fail of admiring our new orlando furioso and soon after released this tender prisoner to me it is evident that the whole scene was got up and concerted for the occasion and was the invention of raleigh himself the romantic incident he well knew was perfectly adapted to the queen's taste another similar incident in which i have been anticipated in the disclosure of the fact though not of its nature was what sir toby matthews obscurely alludes to in his letters of the guilty blow he gave himself in the tower a passage which had long excited my attention till i discovered the curious incident in some manuscript letters of lord cecil raleigh was then confined in the tower for the cobham conspiracy a plot so absurd and obscure that one historian has called it a state riddle but for which so many years after raleigh so cruelly lost his life lord cecil gives an account of the examination of the prisoners involved in this conspiracy one afternoon whilst divers of us were in the tower examining some of these prisoners sir walter attempted to murder himself whereof when we were advertised we came to him and found him in some agony to be unable to endure his misfortunes and protesting innocency with carelessness of life and in that humour he had wounded himself under the right pap but no way mortally being in truth rather a cut than a stab and now very well cured both in body and mind footnote these letters were written by lord cecil to sir thomas parry our ambassador in france and were transcribed from the copy-book of sir thomas parry's correspondence which is preserved in the peepsian library at cambridge End of footnote. this feeble attempt at suicide this cut rather than stab i must place among those scenes in the life of raleigh so incomprehensible with the genius of the man if it were nothing but one of those fears of the brave we must now open another of the follies of the wise raleigh returned from the wild and desperate voyage of guiana with misery in every shape about him he had undertaken the expedition immediately upon his release from the tower in sixteen seventeen the king had never pardoned him and his release was effected by bribing powerful court favourites who worked upon the avarice of james i by leading him to hope for the possession of guiana which though discovered by the spaniards had never been conquered by them and which raleigh promised to colonize in the footnote his son had perished his devoted camus would not survive his reproach and raleigh without fortune and without hope in sickness and in sorrow brooded over the sad thought that in the hatred of the spaniard and in the political pusillanimity of james he was arriving only to meet inevitable death with this presentiment he had even wished to give up his ship to the crew had they consented to land him in france but he was probably irresolute in this decision at sea as he was afterwards at land where he wished to escape and refused to fly 
the clearest intellect was darkened and magnanimity itself became humiliated floating between the sense of honour and of life raleigh landed in his native county of devon his arrival was the common topic of conversation and he was the object of censure or of commiseration but his person was not molested till the fears of james became more urgent than his pity the cervantic gondomar whose quips and quiddities had concealed the cares of state one day rushed into the presence of james breathlessly calling out for audience and compressing his ear-piercing message into the laconic abruptness of piratus 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 there was agony as well as politics in this cry of gondomar whose brother the spanish governor had been massacred in this predatory expedition Footnote. this occurred during the attack on the town of st thomas a settlement of the spaniards near the gold-mines it ended disastrously to raleigh his ships mutinied and he never recovered his ill fortune but sailed to newfoundland and thence after a second mutiny returned to plymouth End of footnote the timid monarch terrified at this tragical appearance of his facetious friend saw at once the demands of the whole spanish cabinet and vented his palliative in a gentle proclamation raleigh having settled his affairs in the west set off for london to appear before the king in consequence of the proclamation a few miles from plymouth he was met by sir lewis stuckley vice-admiral of devon a kinsman and a friend who in communication with government had accepted a sort of surveillance over sir walter it is said and will be credited when we hear the story of stuckley that he had set his heart on the ship as a probable good purchase and on the person against whom to colour his natural treachery he professed an old hatred he first seized on raleigh more like the kinsman than the vice-admiral and proposed travelling together to london and baiting at the houses of the friends of raleigh the warrant which stuckley in the meanwhile had desired was instantly dispatched and the bearer was one manoury a french empiric who was evidently sent to act the part he did a part played at all times and the last title in french politics that so often had recourse to this instrument of state is a mouton raleigh still however was not placed under any harsh restraint his confidential associate captain king accompanied him and it is probable that if raleigh had effectuated his escape he would have conferred a great favour on the government they could not save him at london it is certain that he might have escaped for captain king had hired a vessel and raleigh had stolen out by night and might have reached it but irresolutely returned home another night the same vessel was ready but raleigh never came the loss of his honour appeared the greater calamity as he advanced in this eventful journey everything assumed a more formidable aspect his friends communicated fearful advices a pursuivant or king's messenger gave a more menacing appearance and suggestions arose in his own mind that he was reserved to become a victim of state when letters of commission from the privy council were brought to sir lewis stuckley raleigh was observed to change countenance exclaiming with an oath is it possible my fortune should return upon me thus again he lamented before captain king that he had neglected the opportunity of escape and which every day he advanced inland removed him the more from any chance raleigh at first suspected that manoury was one of those instruments of state who are sometimes employed when open measures are not to be pursued or when the cabinet have not yet determined on the fate of a person implicated in a state crime in a word raleigh thought that manoury was a spy over him and probably over stuckley too the first impression in these matters is usually the right one but when raleigh found himself caught in the toils he imagined that such corrupt agents were to be corrupted the french empiric was sounded and found very compliant raleigh was desirous by his aid to counterfeit sickness and for this purpose invented a series of the most humiliating stratagems 
he imagined that a constant appearance of sickness might produce delay and procrastination in the chapter of accidents might end in pardon he procured vomits from the frenchman and whenever he chose produced every appearance of sickness with dimness of sight dizziness in his head he reeled about and once struck himself with such violence against a pillar in the gallery that there was no doubt of his malady raleigh's servant one morning entering stuckley's chamber declared that his master was out of his senses but that he had just left him in his shirt upon all fours gnawing the rushes upon the floor on stuckley's entrance raleigh was raving and reeling in strong convulsions stuckley ordered him to be chafed and fomented and raleigh afterwards laughed at this scene with manoury observing that he had made stuckley a perfect physician but raleigh found it required some more visible and alarming disease than such ridiculous scenes had exhibited the vomits worked so slowly that manoury was fearful to repeat the doses raleigh inquired whether the empiric knew of any preparation which could make him look ghastly without injuring his health the frenchman offered a harmless ointment to act on the surface of the skin which would give him the appearance of a leper that will do said raleigh for the lords will be afraid to approach me and besides it will move their pity applying the ointment to his brows his arms and his breast the blisters rose the skin inflamed and was covered with purple spots stuckley concluded that raleigh had the plague physicians were now to be called in raleigh took the black silk ribbon from his poignard and manoury tightened it strongly about his arms to disorder his pulse but his pulse beat too strong and regular he appeared to take no food while manoury secretly provided him to perplex the learned doctor still more raleigh had the urinal coloured by a drug of a strong scent the physicians pronounced the disease mortal and that the patient could not be removed into the air without immediate danger a while after being in his bedchamber undressed and no one present but manoury sir walter held a looking-glass in his hand to admire his spotted face Footnote a friend informs me that he saw recently at a print-dealer's a painted portrait of sir walter raleigh with the face thus spotted it is extraordinary that any artist should have chosen such a subject for his pencil but should this be a portrait of the times it shows that this strange stratagem had excited public attention End of footnote and observed in merriment to his new confidant how they should one day laugh for having thus cousin the king council physicians spaniards and all the excuse raleigh offered for this course of poor stratagem so unworthy of his genius was to obtain time and seclusion for writing his apology or vindication of his voyage which has come down to us in his remains the prophet david did make himself a fool and suffered spittle to fall upon his beard to escape from the hands of his enemies said raleigh in his last speech brutus too was another example but his discernment often prevailed over this mockery of his spirit the king licensed him to reside at his own house on his arrival in london on which manoury observed that the king showed by this indulgence that his majesty was favourably inclined towards him but raleigh replied they used all these kinds of flatteries to the duke of byron to draw him fairly into prison and then they cut off his head i know they have concluded among them that it is expedient that a man should die to reassure the traffic which i have broke with spain and manoury adds from whose narrative we have all these particulars that sir walter broke out into this rant if he could but save himself for this time he would plot such plots as should make the king think himself happy to send for him again and restore him to his estate and would force the king of spain to write into england in his favour raleigh at length proposed a flight to france with manoury who declares it was then he revealed to stuckley what he had hitherto concealed that
that stucley might double his vigilance raleigh now perceived that he had two rogues to bribe instead of one and that they were playing into one another's hands proposals are now made to stucley through manoury who is as compliant as his brother knave raleigh presented stucley with a jewel made in the fashion of hail powdered with diamonds with a ruby in the midst but stucley observing to his kinsman and friend that he must lose his office of vice-admiral which had cost him six hundred pounds in case he suffered raleigh to escape raleigh solemnly assured him that he should be no loser and that his lady should give him one thousand pounds when they got into france or holland about this time the french quack took his leave the part he had to act was performed the juggle was complete and two wretches had triumphed over the sagacity and magnanimity of a sage and a hero whom misfortune had levelled to folly and who in violating the dignity of his own character had only equalled himself with vulgar knaves men who exulted that the circumventor was circumvented or as they expressed it the great cousiner was cousined but our story does not here conclude for the treacheries of stuckley were more intricate this perfect villain had obtained a warrant of indemnity to authorize his compliance with any offer to assist raleigh in his escape this wretch was the confidant and the executioner of raleigh he carried about him a license to betray him and was making his profit of the victim before he delivered him to the sacrifice raleigh was still plotting his escape at salisbury he had dispatched his confidential friend captain king to london to secure a boat at tilbury he had also a secret interview with the french agent raleigh's servant mentioned to captain king that his boatswain had a ketch footnote a small coasting vessel made round at stem and stern like the dutch boats the word is still used in some english counties to denote a tub in the footnote of his own and was ready at his service for thirty pieces of silver the boatswain and raleigh's servant acted judas and betrayed the plot to mr william herbert cousin to stuckley and thus the treachery was kept among themselves as a family concern the night for flight was now fixed but he could not part without his friend stuckley who had promised never to quit him and who indeed informed by his cousin herbert had suddenly surprised raleigh putting on a false beard the party met at the appointed place sir lewis stuckley with his son and raleigh disguised stuckley in saluting king asked whether he had not shown himself an honest man king hoped he would continue so they had not rowed twenty strokes before the watermen observed that mr herbert had lately taken boat and made towards the bridge but had returned down the river after them raleigh instantly expressed his apprehensions and wished to return home he consulted king the watermen took flight stuckley acted his part well damning his ill fortune to have a friend whom he would save so full of doubts and fears and threatening to pistol the watermen if they did not proceed even king was overcome by the earnest conduct of stuckley and a new spirit was infused into the rowers as they drew near greenwich a weary crossed them raleigh declared it came to discover them king tried to allay his fears and assured him that if once they reached gravesend he would hazard his life to get to tilbury but in these delays and discussions the tide was failing the watermen declared they could not reach gravesend before morning raleigh would have landed at purfleet and the boatswain encouraged him for there it was thought he could procure horses for tilbury sir lewis stuckley too was zealous and declared he was content to carry the cloak-bag on his own shoulders for half a mile but king declared that it was useless they could not at that hour get horses to go by land they rode a mile beyond woolwich approaching two or three catches when the boatswain doubted whether any of these were the one he had provided to furnish them we are betrayed cried raleigh and ordered the watermen to row back he strictly examined the boatswain alas his ingenuity was baffled by a shuffling villain whose real answer appeared when a weary hailed the boat 
riley observed that it contained herbert's crew he saw that all was now discovered he took stuckley aside his ingenious mind still suggesting projects for himself to return home in safety or how stuckley might plead that he had only pretended to go with raleigh to seize on his private papers they whispered together and raleigh took some things from his pocket and handed them to stuckley probably more rubies powdered with diamonds some effect was instantaneously produced for the tender heart of his friend stuckley relented and he not only repeatedly embraced him with extraordinary warmth of affection but was voluble in effusions of friendship and fidelity stuckley persuaded raleigh to land at gravesend the strange wary which had dogged him landing at the same time these were people belonging to mr herbert and sir william st john who it seems had formerly shared in the spoils of this unhappy hero on greenwich bridge stuckley advised captain king that it would be advantageous to sir walter that king should confess that he had joined with stuckley to betray his master and raleigh lent himself to the suggestion of stuckley of whose treachery he might still be uncertain but king a rough and honest seaman declared that he would not share in the odium at the moment he refused stuckley arrested the captain in the king's name committing him to the charge of herbert's men they then proceeded to a tavern but raleigh who now viewed the monster in his true shape observed sir lewis these actions will not turn out to your credit and on the following day when they passed through the tower gate raleigh turning to king observed stuckley and my servant cotterell have betrayed me you need be in no fear of danger but as for me it is i who am the mark that is shot at thus concludes the narrative of captain king the fate of raleigh soon verified the prediction this long narrative of treachery will not however be complete unless we wind it up with the fate of the infamous stuckley fiction gives perfection to its narratives by the privilege it enjoys of disposing of its criminals in the most exemplary manner but the labours of the historian are not always refreshed by this moral pleasure retribution is not always discovered in the present stage of human existence yet history is perhaps equally delightful as fiction whenever its perfect catastrophes resemble those of romantic invention the present is a splendid example i have discovered the secret history of sir lewis stuckley in several manuscript letters of the times raleigh in his admirable address from the scaffold where he seemed to be rather one of the spectators than the sufferer declared he forgave sir lewis for he had forgiven all men but he was bound in charity to caution all men against him and such as he is raleigh's last and solemn notice of the treachery of his kinsman and friend was irrevocably fatal to this wretch the hearts of the people were open to the deepest impressions of sympathy melting into tears at the pathetic address of the magnanimous spirit who had touched them in one moment sir lewis stuckley became an object of execration throughout the nation he soon obtained a new title that of sir judas and was shunned by every man to remove the cane-like mark which god and men had fixed on him he published an apology for his conduct a performance which at least for its ability might raise him in our consideration but i have since discovered in one of the manuscript letter writers that it was written by dr sharp who had been a chaplain to henry prince of wales the writer pleads in stuckley's justification that he was a state agent that it was lawful to lie for the discovery of treason that he had a personal hatred towards raleigh for having abridged his father of his share of some prize money and then enters more into raleigh's character who being desperate of any fortune here agreeable to the height of his mind would have made up his fortune elsewhere upon any terms against his sovereign and his country is it not marvel continues the personifier of stuckley that he was angry with me at his death for bringing him back besides being a man of so great a wit it was no small grief that a man of mean wit as i should be thought to go beyond him 
no sic ars delutur arte neque enim lex justior eula esquam messit artificies arte periri sua this apt latinity betrays dr sharp but why did you not execute your commission bravely openly why my commission was to the contrary to discover his pretensions and to seize his secret papers etc footnote buckley's humble petition touching the bringing up sir w raleigh quarto sixteen eighteen republished in summer's tracts volume three seven hundred and fifty one in the footnote but the doctor though no unskilful writer here wrote in vain for what ingenuity can veil the turpitude of long and practised treachery to keep up appearances sir judas resorted more than usually to court where however he was perpetually enduring rebuffs or avoided as one infected with the plague of treachery he offered the king in his own justification to take the sacrament that whatever he had laid to raleigh's charge was true and would produce two unexceptionable witnesses to do the like why then replied his majesty the more malicious was sir walter to utter these speeches at his death sir thomas badger who stood by observed let the king take off stuckley's head as stuckley has done sir walter's and let him at his death take the sacrament and his oath upon it and i'll believe him but still stuckley loses his head i shall credit sir walter raleigh's bare affirmative before a thousand of stuckley's oaths when stuckley on pretence of giving an account of his office placed himself in the audience chamber of the lord admiral and his lordship passed him without any notice sir judas attempted to address the earl but with a bitter look his lordship exclaimed base fellow darest thou who art the scorn and contempt of men offer thyself in my presence were it not in my own house i would cudgel thee with my staff for presuming on this sauciness this annihilating affront stuckley hastened to convey to the king his majesty answered him what wouldst thou have me do wouldst thou have me hang him of my soul if i should hang all that speak ill of thee all the trees of the country would not suffice so great is the number one of the frequent crimes of that age ere the forgery of bank-notes existed was the clipping of gold and this was one of the private amusements suitable to the character of our sir judas treachery and forgery are the same crime in a different form stuckley received out of the exchequer five hundred pounds as the reward of his espionage and perfidy it was the price of blood and was hardly in his hands ere it was turned into the fraudulent coin of the cheater he was seized on in the palace of whitehall for diminishing the gold coin the manner of the dis discovery says the manuscript writer was strange if my occasions would suffer me to relate the particulars on his examination he attempted to shift the crime to his own son who had fled and on his man who being taken in the words of the letter-writer was willing to set the saddle upon the right horse and accused his master manouri too the french empiric was arrested at plymouth for the same crime and accused his worthy friend but such was the interest of stuckley with government bought probably with his last shilling and as one says with his last shirt that he obtained his own and his son's pardon for a crime that ought to have finally concluded the history of this blessed family footnote the anecdotes respecting stuckley i have derived from manuscript letters and they were considered to be of so dangerous a nature that the writer recommends secrecy and requests after reading that they may be burnt with such injunctions i have generally found that the letters were the more carefully preserved End of footnote. a more solemn and tragical catastrophe was reserved for the perfidious stuckley he was deprived of his place of vice-admiral and left destitute in the world abandoned by all human beings and most probably by the son whom he had tutored in the arts of villainy he appears to have wandered about 
an infamous and distracted beggar it is possible that even so seared a conscience may have retained some remaining touch of sensibility all our men condemned alike to groan the tender for another's pain the unfeeling for his own and camden has recorded among his historical notes on james the first and in august sixteen twenty lewis stuckley who betrayed sir walter raleigh died in a manner mad such is the catastrophe of one of the most perfect domestic tales and a historical example not easily paralleled of moral retribution the secret practices of the sir judas of the court of james the first which i have discovered throw light on an odd tradition which still exists in the neighbourhood of afton once the residence of this wretched man the country people have long entertained a notion that a hidden treasure lies at the bottom of a well in his grounds guarded by some supernatural power a tradition no doubt originated in this man's history and an obscure allusion to the gold which stuckley received for his bribe or the other gold which he clipped and might have there concealed this is a striking instance of the many historical facts which though entirely unknown or forgotten may be often discovered to lie hid or disguised in popular traditions End of section twelve. Section number thirteen of Curiosities of Literature, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Curiosities of Literature, Volume Three, by Isaac de Israeli an authentic narrative of the last hours of sir walter raleigh the close of the life of sir walter raleigh was as extraordinary as many parts of his varied history the promptitude and sprightliness of his genius his carelessness of life and the equanimity of this great spirit in quitting the world can only be paralleled by a few other heroes and sages raleigh was both but it is not simply his dignified yet active conduct on the scaffold nor his admirable speech on that occasion circumstances by which many great men are judged when their energies are excited for a moment to act so great a part before the eyes of the world assembled at their feet it is not these only which claim our notice we may pause with admiration on the real grandeur of raleigh's character not from a single circumstance however great but from a tissue of continued little incidents which occurred from the moment of his condemnation till he laid his head on the block raleigh was a man of such mark that he deeply engaged the attention of his contemporaries, and to this we owe the preservation of several interesting particulars of what he did and what he said, which have entered into his life, but all has not been told in the published narratives. Contemporary writers in their letters have set down every fresh incident, and eagerly caught up his sense, his wit, and what is more delightful those marks of the natural cheerfulness of his invariable presence of mind nor could these have arisen from any afflection or parade for we shall see that they served him even in his last tender farewell to his lady and on many unpremeditated occasions i have drawn together into a short compass all the facts which my researches have furnished not omitting those which are known concerning the feelings and conduct of raleigh at these solemn moments of his life to have preserved only the new would have been to mutilate the statue and to injure the whole by an imperfect view raleigh one morning was taken out of his bed in a fit of fever and unexpectedly hurried not to his trial 
but to a sentence of death the story is well known yet pleading with a voice grown weak by sickness and an og he had at that instant on him he used every means to avert his fate he did therefore value the life he could so easily part with his judges there at least respected their state criminal and they addressed him in a tone far different from that which he had fifteen years before listened to from coke yelverton the attorney-general said sir walter raleigh hath been as a star at which the world have gazed but stars may fall nay they must fall when they trouble the sphere which they abide and the lord chief justice noticed raleigh's great work i know that you have been valiant and wise and i doubt not but you retain both these virtues for now you shall have occasion to use them your book is an admirable work i would give you counsel but i know you can apply unto yourself far better than i am able to give you but the judge ended with saying execution is granted it was stifling raleigh with roses the heroic sage felt as if listening to fame from the voice of death he declared that now being old sickly and in disgrace and certain were he allowed to live to go on to it again life was wearisome to him and all he entreated was to leave to speak freely at his farewell to satisfy the world that he was ever loyal to the king and a true lover of the commonwealth for this he would seal with his blood raleigh on his return to his prison while some were deploring his fate observed that the world itself is but a larger prison out of which some are daily selected for execution that last night of his existence was occupied by writing what the letter writer calls a remembrancer to be left with his lady to acquaint the world with his sentiments should he be denied their delivery from the scaffold as he had been at the bar of the king's bench his lady visited him that night and amidst her tears acquainted him that she had obtained the favor of disposing of his body to which he answered smiling it is well bess that thou mayst dispose of that dead thou hadst not always the disposing of when it was alive at midnight he entreated her to leave him it must have been then that with unshaken fortitude raleigh sat down to compose those verses on his death which being short the most appropriate may be repeated even such is time that takes on trust our youth our joys are all we have and pays us but with age and dust who in the dark and silent grave when we have wandered all our ways shuts up the story of our days he has added two other lines expressive of his trust in his resurrection their authenticity is confirmed by the writer of the present letter as well as another writer enclosing half a dozen verses which sir walter made the night before his death to take his farewell of poetry wherein he had been a scribbler even from his youth the enclosure is not now with the letter chamberlain the writer was an intelligent man of the world but not imbued with any deep tincture of literature on the same night raleigh wrote this ditch of the candle burning dimly cowards fear to die but courage stout rather than live in snuff will be put out at this solemn moment before he lay down to rest and at the instant of parting from his lady with all his domestic affections still warm to express his feelings in verse was with him a natural effusion and one to which he had long been used it is peculiar to the fate of raleigh 
that having before suffered a long imprisonment with an expectation of public death his mind had been accustomed to its contemplation and had often dwelt on the event which was now passing the soul in its sudden departure and its future state is often the subject of his few poems that most original one the farewell go soul the body's guest upon a thankless errand etc is attributed to raleigh though on uncertain evidence but another entitled the pilgrimage has this beautiful passage give me my scallop shell of quiet my staff of truth to walk upon my script of joy immortal diet my bottle of salvation my gown of glory hope's true gauge and thus i'll take my pilgrimage whilst my soul like a quiet palmer traveleth toward the land of heaven raleigh's cheerfulness was so remarkable and his fearlessness of death so marked that the dean of westminster who attended him at first wondering at the hero reprehended the lightness of his manner but raleigh gave god thanks that he had never feared death for it was but an opinion and an imagination and as for the manner of death he would rather die so than of a burning fever and that some might have made shows outwardly but he felt the joy within the dean says that he made no more of his death than if he had been to take a journey not said he but that i am a great sinner for i have been a soldier a seaman and a courtier the writer of a manuscript letter tells us that the dean declared he died not only religiously but he found him to be a man as ready and as able to give as to take instruction on the morning of his death he smoked as usual his favorite tobacco and when they brought him a cup of excellent sack being asked how he liked it raleigh answered as a fellow that drinking of st giles bowl as he went to tyburn said that was a good drink if a man might tarry by it footnote in the old time when prisoners were conveyed from newgate to tyburn they stopped about midway at the old hospital at st giles in the fields and says stowe were presented with a great bowl of ale therefore to drink at their pleasure as to be their last refreshment in this life End of footnote. the day before in passing from westminster hall to the gatehouse his eye had caught sir hugh beston in the throng and calling on him raleigh requested that he would see him die to-morrow sir hugh to secure himself a seat on the scaffold had provided himself with a letter to the sheriff which was not read at the time and sir walter found his friend thrust by lamenting that he could not get there farewell exclaimed raleigh i know not what shift you will make but i am sure to have a place in going from the prison to the scaffold among others who were pressing hard to see him one old man whose head was bald came very forward insomuch that raleigh noticed him and asked whether he would have aught of him the old man answered nothing but to see him and pray god for him raleigh replied i thank thee good friend and i am sorry i have no better thing to return thee for thy good will observing his bald head he continued but take this nightcap which was a very rich wrought one that he wore for thou hast more need of it now than i his dress as was usual with him was elegant if not rich footnote raleigh's love of dress is conspicuous in the early portraits of him we possess and particularly so in the one engraved by lodge 
end of footnote. Audes described it, but mentions that he had a wrought nightcap under his hat. This we have otherwise disposed of. He wore a rough band, a black wrought velvet nightgown over a hair-colored satin doublet, and a black wrought waistcoat, black cuff tafty breeches, and ash-colored silk stockings. He ascended the scaffold with the same cheerfulness as he had passed to it, and observing the lords seated at a distance, some at windows, he requested they would approach him, as he wished that they should all witness what he had to say. The request was complied with by several. His speech is well known, but some copies contain matters not in others. When he finished, he requested Lord Arundel that the king would not suffer any libels to defame him after death. And now I have a long journey to go, and must take my leave. He embraced all the lords and other friends with such courtly compliments, as if he had met them at some feast, says a letter writer. Having taken off his gown, he called to the headsman to show him the axe, which not being instantly done, he repeated, I pray thee, let me see it. Dost thou think that I am afraid of it? He passed the edge lightly over his finger, and smiling, observed to the sheriff, This is a sharp medicine, but a sound cure for all diseases, and kissed it and laid it down. Another writer has, This is that, that will cure all sorrows. After this he went to three several corners of the scaffold, and kneeling down, desired all the people to pray for him, and recited a long prayer to himself. When he began to fit himself for the block, he first laid himself down to try how the block fitted him. After rising up, the executioner kneeled down to ask for his forgiveness, which Raleigh, with an embrace, gave, but entreated him not to strike till he gave a token by lifting up his hand, and then fear not but strike home. When he laid his head down to receive the stroke, the executioner desired him to lay his face towards the east. It was no great matter which way a man's head stood, so that the heart lay right, said Raleigh, but these were not his last words. He was once more to speak in this world with the same intrepidity he had lived in it for having lain some minutes on the block in prayer he gave the signal but the executioner either unmindful or in fear failed to strike and raleigh after once or twice putting forth his hands was compelled to ask him why dost thou not strike strike man in two blows he was beheaded but from the first his body never shrunk from the spot by any discomposure of his posture, which, like his mind, was immovable. In all the time he was upon the scaffold, and before, says one of the manuscript letter writers, there appeared not the least alteration in him, either in his voice or countenance, but he seemed as free from all manner of apprehension, as if he had been come thither rather to be a spectator than a sufferer. Nay, the beholders seem much more sensible than did he, so that he hath purchased here in the opinion of men such honour and reputation, as it is thought his greatest enemies are they that are most sorrowful for his death, which they see is like to turn so much to his advantage. The people were deeply affected at the sight, and so much that one said that we had not such another head to cut off, and another wished the head and brains to be upon Secretary Naughton's shoulders. The observer suffered for this. He was a wealthy citizen and great newsmonger, and one who haunted Paul's walk. 
complaint was made and the citizen was summoned to the privy council he pleaded that he intended no disrespect to mr secretary but only spoke in reference to the old proverb that two heads were better than one his excuse was allowed at the moment but when afterwards called on for a contribution to st paul's cathedral and having subscribed a hundred pounds the secretary observed to him that two are better than one mr weinmark either from fear or charity the witty citizen doubled his subscription footnote the general impression was so much in disfavor of this judicial murder that james thought it politic to publish an eight-volume pamphlet in 1618 entitled a declaration of the demeanor and carriage of sir walter raleigh knight as well as his voyage as in and since his return and of the true motives and inducements which occasioned his majesty to proceed in doing justice upon him and hath been done it takes the whole question apologetically of the license given him to guiana as his majesty's honour was in a manner engaged not to deny unto his people the adventure and hope of such great riches as the mines of that island might yield it afterward details his proceedings there which are declared criminal dangerous to his majesty's allies and an abuse of his commission it ends by defending his execution because he could not by law be judicially called in question for that his former attainer of treason is the highest and last work of the law whereby he was a civilator mortis his majesty was enforced except attainers should become privileges for all subsequent offences to resolve to have him executed upon his former attender End of footnote. thus died this glorious and gallant cavalier of whom osborne says his death was managed by him with so high and religious a resolution as if a roman had acted a christian or rather a christian a roman footnote the chief particulars in this narrative are drawn from two manuscript letters of the day in the sloan collection under their respective dates november third sixteen eighteen larkin to sir theos pickering october thirteenth sixteen eighteen chamberlain's letters End note. after having read the previous article we are astonished at the greatness and the variable nature of this extraordinary man and this happy genius with gibbon who once mediated to write his life we may pause and pronounce his character ambiguous but we shall not hesitate to decide that raleigh knew better how to die than to live his glorious hours say a contemporary were his arraignment and execution but never will be forgotten the intermediate years of his lettered imprisonment the imprisonment of the learned may sometimes be their happiest leisure end of section thirteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section fourteen of curiosities of literature volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c curiosities of literature volume three by isaac de israeli literary unions a union of talents differing in qualities might carry some important works to a more extended perfection in a work of great enterprise the aid of a friendly hand may be absolutely necessary to complete the labors of the projector 
who may have neither the courage the leisure nor all necessary acquisitions for performing the favorite task which he has otherwise matured many great works commenced by a master genius have remained unfinished or have been deficient for want of this friendly secure the public would have been grateful to johnson had he united in his dictionary the labors of some learned etymologist speed's chronicle owes most of its value as it does its ornaments to the hand of sir robert cotton and the other curious researchers who contributed entire portions goguet's esteemed work of the origin of the arts and sciences was greatly indebted to the fraternal zeal of a devoted friend the still valued books of the port royal society were all formed by this happy union the secret history of many eminent works would show the advantages which may be derived from that combination of talents differing in their nature cumberland's mastery versions of the fragments of the greek dramatic poets would never have been given to the poetical world had he not accidentally possessed the manuscript notes of his relative the learned bentley this treasure supplied that research in the most obscure works which the volatile studies of cumberland could never have explored a circumstance which he concealed from the world proud of the greek erudition which he thus cheaply possessed yet by this literary union bentley's vast erudition made these researches which cumberland could not and cumberland gave the nation a copy of the domestic drama of greece of which bentley was incapable there is a large work which is still celebrated of which the composition has excited the astonishment even of the philosophic hume but whose secret history remains yet to be disclosed this extraordinary volume is the history of the world by raleigh i shall transcribe hume's observations that the reader may observe the literary phenomenon they were struck with the extensive genius of the man who being educated amidst naval and military enterprises had surpassed in the pursuits of literature even those of the most recluse and sedentary lives and they admired his unbroken magnanimity which at his age and under his circumstances could engage him to undertake and execute so great a work as the history of the world now when the truth is known the wonderful in this literary mystery will disappear except in the eloquent the grand and the pathetic passages interspersed in that venerable volume we may indeed pardon the astonishment of our calm philosopher when we consider the recondite matter contained in this work and recollect the little time which this adventurous spirit whose life was passed in fabricating his own fortune and in perpetual enterprise could allow to such erudite pursuits where could raleigh obtain that familiar acquaintance with the rabbins of whose language he was probably entirely ignorant his numerous publications the effusions of a most active mind though excellent in their kind were evidently composed by one who was not abstracted in curious and remote inquiries but full of the daily business and the wisdom of human life the confinement in the tower which lasted several years was indeed sufficient for the composition of this folio volume and of a second which appears to have occupied him but in that imprisonment it singularly happened that he lived among literary characters with most intimate friendship there he joined the earl of northumberland the patron of the philosophers of his age and with whom raleigh pursued his chemical studies and surgeon hoskins a poet and a wit and the poetical father of ben jonson who acknowledged that 
it was Hoskins who had polished him, and that Raleigh often consulted Hoskins on his literary works. I learn from a manuscript, but however literary the atmosphere of the tower proved to Raleigh, no particle of Hebrew, and perhaps little Grecian lore, floated from a chemist and a poet. The truth is that the collection of the materials of this history was the labor of several persons, who have not all been discovered. It has been ascertained that Ben Jonson was a considerable contributor, and there was an English philosopher from whom Descartes, it is said, even by his own countrymen, borrowed largely Thomas Harrott, whom Anthony Wood charges with infusing into Raleigh's volume philosophical notions, while Raleigh was composing his history of the world. But if Raleigh's pursuits surpassed even those of the most recluse and sedentary lives, as Hume observes, we must attribute this to a Dr. Robert Burrell, rector of Northwald, and the county of Norfolk, who was a great favorite of Sir Walter Raleigh, and had been his chaplain. All, or the great part, of the drudgery of Sir Walter's history for criticisms, chronology, and reading Greek and Hebrew authors, was performed by him for Sir Walter. Footnote. I draw my information from a very singular manuscript in the Lansdowne Collection which I think has been mistaken for a boy's ciphering book, of which it has much the appearance. Number 741, fo 57, as it stands in the auctioneer's catalogue. It appears to be a collection closely written, extracted out of Anthony Wood's papers, and as I have discovered in the manuscript numerous notices not elsewhere preserved, I am inclined to think that the transcriber copied them from the mass of Anthony Wood's papers, of which more than one sackful was burnt at his desire before him when dying. If it be so, then M.S. is the only register of many curious facts. Ben Jonson has been too freely censured for his own free censures, and particularly for one he made on Sir Walter Raleigh, who, he told Drummond, esteemed more fame than conscience. Thy best wits in England were employed in making its history. Ben himself had written a piece to him of the Prunic War, which he altered and set in his book. Johnson's powerful advocate, Mr. Gifford, has not alleged a word in the defense of our great bard's free conversational strictures. The secret history of Raleigh's great work had never been discovered. On this occasion, however, Johnson only spoke what he knew to be true and there may have been other truths. In these conversations which were set down at random by Drummond, who may have chiefly recollected the satirical touches. End footnote. Thus a simple fact, when discovered, clears up the whole mystery, and we learn how that knowledge was acquired, which, as whom sagaciously detected, required a recluse and sedentary life, such as the studies and the habits of a country clergyman would have been in a learned age. The secret history of another work, still more celebrated than the, the history of the world by Sir Walter Raleigh, will doubtless surprise its numerous admirers. Without the aid of a friendly hand, we should probably have been deprived of the delightful history of artists by Vasari, although a mere painter and goldsmith and not a literary man. Vasari was blessed with the nice discernment of one deeply conversant with art, and saw rightly what was to be done, 
when the idea of the work was suggested by the celebrated Paulus Jovius as a supplement to his own work of the eulogiums of illustrious men. Vasari approved of the project, but on that occasion judiciously observed, not blinded by the celebrity of the literary man who projected it, that it would require the assistance of an artist to collect the materials and arrange them in their proper order, for though Jovius displayed great knowledge in his observations, yet he had not been equally accurate in the arrangement of his facts in his book of eulogiums. Afterwards, when Vasari began to collect his information and consulted Paulus Jovius on the plan, although that author highly approved of what he saw, he alleged his own want of leisure and ability to complete such an enterprise, and this was fortunate we should otherwise have had, instead of the rambling spirit which charms us in the volumes of Vasari, the verbose babble of a disclaimer. Vasari, however, looked round for the assistance he wanted, a circumstance which Terraboshi had not noticed. Like Hogarth, he required a literary man for his scribe. I have discovered the name of the chief writer of the lives of the painters who wrote under the direction of Vasari, and probably often used his own natural style, and conveyed to us those reflections which surely come from their source. I shall give the passage, as a curious instance where the secret history of books is often detected in the most obscure corners of research. Who could have imagined that in a collection of the lives de la Sante a beauty del ordinine predicatori we are to look for the writer of vasari's lives don serafini razzi the author of this a classic classical biography has this reference who would see more of this may turn to the lives of the painters sculptors and architects written for the greater part by don silvano razzi my brother, for the Signor Cavalier, Monsieur Giorgio Vasari, his great friend. Footnote. I find this quotation in a sort of polemical work of natural philosophy, entitled Saggio di Storia Literia Florienta de Secolo the Seventeenth, de Giovanni Clementi Nelli, Lucia. 1759, page 58. N Nelly also refers to what he had said on this subject in his Piant ad Alzati di S. M. de Flore, page 6 and page 7, a work on architecture. C. Brunet and Hayam, Beeb, Italian, de Libra, Rari. End footnote. The discovery that Vasari's volumes were not entirely written by himself, though probably under his dictation and unquestionably with his communications, as we know that Dr. Morrow wrote the analysis of beauty for Horgoth, will perhaps serve to clear up some unaccountable mistakes or admissions which appear in the series of volumes, written at long intervals and by different hands. Mr. Fuseli has alluded to them in utter astonishment and cannot account for Vasari's incredible dereliction of reminiscence, which prompted him to transfer what he had rightly ascribed to Giorgione in one edition to the elder Parma in subsequent ones. Again, Vasari's memory was either so treacherous or his rapidity in writing so inconsiderate that his account of the Capella Sistina and the Stanze of Raffaello is a mere heap of errors and unpardonable confusion. Even Botari, his learned editor, is at a loss how to account for his mistakes. Mr. Fuseli finally observes, 
he has been called the herodotus of our art and if the main simplicity of his narrative and the desire of heaping anecdote on anecdote entitle him in some degree to that appellation we ought not to forget that the information of every day adds something to the authenticity of the greek historian whilst every day furnishes matter to question on the credibility of the tuscan all this strongly confirms the suspicion that vasari employed different hands at different times to write out his work such mistakes would occur to a new writer not always conversant with the subject he was composing on and disjointed materials of which were often found in a disordered state it is however strange that neither botari nor tiraboshi appears to have been aware that vasari employed others to write for him we see that from the first suggestion of the work he had originally proposed that paus jovius should hold the pen for him the principle illustrated in this article might be pursued but the secret history of the two great works so well known is as sufficient as twenty others writing less celebrated the literary phenomenon which has puzzled the calm inquiring hume to cry out a miracle has been solved by the discovery of a little fact on literary unions which derives importance from this circumstance footnote mr patrick fraser tyler in his recent biography of sir walter raleigh a work of vigorous research and elegant composition has dedicated to me a supernumerary article in his appendix entitled mr de israeli's errors he has inferred from the present article that i denied that raleigh was the writer of his own great work because i have shown how great works may be advantageously pursued by the aid of literary union it is a monstrous inference the chimera which plays before his eyes is his own contrivance he starts at his own phantomorsgalia and leaves me after all to fight with his shadow mr tyler has not contradicted a single statement of mine i have carefully read his article and my own and i have made no alteration i may be allowed to add that there is much redundant matter in the article of mr tyler and to use the legal style there is much impertinence which with a little candor and a more philosophy he would strike his pen through as sound lawyers do on these occasions end of footnote end of section 14 recording by linda Marie nielsen vancouver bc